Good evening, guests, and welcome tonight to the Chow Chak Wing Museum. My name is Craig Barker. I am the Head of Public Engagement for the Museum. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting today on Gadigal land and to pay our respect to the traditional custodians, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We are on unceded lands and the Chow Chak Wing Museum and the University of Sydney more broadly wishes to pay our respect to that thousands of generations of connection with country. Um, for those of you who have never been to the Chow Chak Wing Museum before, a welcome to you and we hope to see you again in future. If you would like to explore some of our activities, they're a little bit older than we're talking about tonight. Um, we invite you to join us on Sunday for our Egyptian um, Cultural Day, which will feature dance, music and floor talks from the Australian Egyptian community and continuing the Egyptian theme on Friday the 17th of November, a public lecture by uh, Dr. Mustafa Waziri, who is the Director of the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt. Um, <coughs> given the Australian Museum show, you've got to be hearing a lot of ancient Egypt in the coming months, just to warn you. But tonight is a very, very special evening, and the Chow Chak Wing Museum is honoured to be able to host the launch of Kira Lindsay's book, Wild Love. And it is my great privilege to be able to introduce our presenters tonight and to uh, MC the event. Um, we will begin with a uh, in conversation. Um, there will be an opportunity for you to ask some questions of Kira and I'll run around with a microphone. And then most importantly, a opportunity for you to purchase a copy of the book and get it signed by Kira. Afterwards, you are most welcome to join us in Sounds Cafe down on level two afterwards for a glass of wine as well. Dr. Kira Lindsay is an award-winning author and historian for more than 20 years, enthusiastically exploring historical ideas and deepening our interest in understanding of the past. She is by all definitions, the model of a public historian. And I had the great privilege this morning of spending time with Kira um, to record a podcast episode. And um, um, I think, uh, well, we got rudely interrupted, didn't we? But I think <laughs> that could quite easily have been a two hour conversation, which was fascinating. Um, in 2009, Kira uh, was the inaugural winner of the Greg Denning Memorial Award. And um, in 2018 was awarded an ARC uh, DECRA grant uh, entitled speculative, uh, speculative Biography, Historical Craft, and the Case of Adelaide Ironside. The funding allowed Kira to visit more than 20 archival holdings across Australia, uh, the UK, and Italy, following in the footsteps of colonial artist Adelaide Ironside. And the work tonight is the result of that extraordinary amount of um, investigative archival and historical research. So it's so, so pleasing to see the end result. Kira's first speculative biography, The Convict's Daughter, published with Allen and Unwin in 2016 and described as uh, uh, audacious and splendid and gloriously unput, unput downable book, um, <laughs> was um, incredibly well received. And in 2021, she co-edited the Rutledge Collection on speculative biography, now considered one of the definitive um, works on this new way of interpreting history. In addition, in addition to working for the History Trust of South Australia as the History Advocate of South Australia, a 21st century reinvention of the state historian of South Australia role, Kira has also volunteered with numerous his history organisations. She was Vice President of the History Council of New South Wales between 2020 and 2022, a member of the Sydney Living's Museum Public Engagement Working Party over the same time period, and is currently on the executive of the History Council of South Australia, as well as being a fellow for the Australian Dictionary of Biography and serving on the editorial boards for a number Stop of Stop it. It's going on too long. For hell, did you find time to write a book? <laughs> uh, conversation tonight with Kira. It's a great privilege to welcome Sue Williams as well. Best-selling author, award-winning journalist, travel writer, and non-fiction author. Um, the author of the historical novel, a highly acclaimed historical novel, novel Elizabeth and Elizabeth, also set in early colonial Australia. And I would also like to point out that you can also purchase today, and I think also get a signature too, if you have got Sue, um, from the shop, uh, Sue's book published earlier this year, That Fly Girl, as well. Um, 
Sue has developed a writing style that tells a story as evocatively as possible with a keen interest for detail. Her biography, uh, uh, her bibliographies, uh, sorry, her biographies rather, um, 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 cover a whole range of Australian leaders from Professor Fiona Wood, Father Bob and Father Chris Riley, among others. It is my great pleasure to introduce Sue Williams in conversation with our author tonight, Dr. Kira Lindsay. <laughs> Sorry, Craig, for giving you that ridiculous bio, never again. <laughs> well, it's great to be here tonight, and thank you all for coming. We're, I think we're all really excited to hear what you're saying. And I have a bit of, conf bit of a confession right at the very beginning. I started off absolutely hating Kira Lindsay. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I was writing my first book, my first, uh, <laughs> my first fiction, um, historical fiction, um, the, my publisher looked at it and said, no, this is, this is not going anywhere read this book. And I said, what is this book? Convict's Daughter. She said, read this book and you maybe you'll learn how to write these books properly. And so I poured over every word of the Convict's Daughter thinking, oh God, Kira Lindsay, she must be such an awful person. I am. <laughs> Here we are. No. <laughs> it was a fabulous book and it really was a great inspiration for me when I started to write um, in fiction as well. And this is a great book as well. I really enjoyed Wild Love. And I just wanted to know, how did you come across Adelaide Ironside and, and what captured your imagination about her? Mm. Thanks, Sue. I hope you don't still hate me. No, no. <laughs> I'm uh, warming to you. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> um, so, look, I, um, I became, I did my first Masters of Hamilton Hume and, and William Hilton Hovel and their expedition into the interior of the South uh, when they ostensibly kind of discovered whatever, the um, Port Phillip region in 1824-25. And one of the things that really struck me was the patriotic strains that reflected Hamilton Hume, uh, who was born or what we might call really a European-born um, Australian, uh, one of the first generation, and, uh, or known as currency lads. So I became fascinated with the patriotic, the vigorous patriotic sentiment of that he expressed quite often. And as I sort of delved into the archives, it became more and more apparent that these currency lads were always at parties where they were toasting themselves in the country, saying things like, the land boys we live in, isn't it bloody marvellous? In fact, it says that they were punctuating their every phrases with this expletive bloody, which uh, travellers thought were outrageous. But my question was, well, what about the currency lasses? Where do they stand? They seem to be quite silent in, in the story. And when I was talking about this to my folks, and my mum suddenly jumped up out of the off the you know out of her seat at the dinner table and said, "We've got one of those. We've got a currency lass." And it was a woman called Mary Ann Gill, who was my great 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 aunt. And when she was just um, on her sixteenth birthday, she shimmied down the drain pipe outside her bedroom window to elope with the Attorney General's wayward second son. Wayward he certainly was. The father didn't like the idea of this, came after them with his pistols blazing, attempted to murder James Butler Conchella, and they were all hauled up before the courts. And so I story because I was fascinated with this little my mum presented to me, which had the moment that Mary Ann Gill the evidence box in the witness box in, in the Supreme Sydney Courts. And she at that very moment, the newspaper being said, too agitated to speak. And I just love the, the 16 year old girl standing in this legal place with her father eyeballing her and her suitor thinking, my fate and my future lies in your hand because her suitor was a, a crime which had only just ceased to be a capital felony at the time that he was um, up for arrest. So I told that story, but you know, fabulous it was in terms of the newspaper records and in terms of the legal deposition I found, which included the signature splotched marks, mm. I think, which were tear marks. Um, what I didn't find was any answers to that broader question about patriotic sentiments of currency lasses. But you know, a little bit after I'd finished the book, Elizabeth and I were chatting and she said, do you think you've got another book in you? This is the commissioning editor sitting right there. 
And, uh, and I started to think about it. And suddenly out of nowhere, one morning came uh, the name Adelaide Ironside. And I'd read a few things about her in the Australian Dictionary of Biography 10 years earlier. And suddenly there she was back in my mind. So I went and started looking at her. And uh, lo and behold, her archives were unbelievably rich. It was, comparatively speaking, this uh, demographic of women, it was an abundance of riches. And yet, of course, not all is quite as it seems because that correspondence, particularly the stuff in the state records of, in the State Library of New South Wales, is entitled Correspondence Mainly Received. And what that means is that most of those letters are from people to Adelaide, and many of them are quite famous people. So it's from John Ruskin, from Charles Nixon, uh, from um, all sorts of people who knew and um, kind of came into the, into the Ironside's life, but very little from Adelaide. But she did publish over 20 poems in Sydney's most radical newspaper, The People's Advocate, and these poems are cracking, Sue, because they are infused with this Republican, fiery Republican sentiment. But it's also a form of mysticism. You know, she's not talking about the kind of Republicanism that we might associate with our 20th century expressions. This is an idea that Australia's future lies in it becoming wholly wild, she says. It must grab its future and bind on the buckling, find its mystical future by being free, independent and golden. And I just thought this was so intriguing. And in fact, when she, in her letters to Dr. John Dunmore Lang, who, who was her closest friend, a real fiery controversialist, always in and out of and a Presbyterian um, minister. And uh, she says to him, you know, I'm going to elevate my sex. I'm, I want to go overseas to elevate my sex, to hoist the colours of my dear old country abroad and to return eventually to Australia as the acknowledged mistress of art in the Southern Hemisphere. And so here is a story about a woman who has a self-consciously patriotic agenda. And that allows us to start to look at that dark and complex heart of early Australian pa patriotism, which I think still infuses Australian nationalism, and to see in that the feminine contribution to that. So when we think about Australian nationalism, I think we need to see that these currency-led influences are there, but also the currency-less influences. And Adelaide allows us to tell that story. Oh, so why the title? Where does the title come from? Is huh? it from that, that wild I'm life? so glad you asked, because I prepared something for just that question. <laughs> <laughs> so these, we do, this is that little, <laughs> this is that little ex Am I um, from, from the uh, comic sort of that got me on the Marianne Hill. And here's, here is Adelaide Ironside. Isn't this just an extraordinary photo? This was a publicity photo that was taken of her when she was in Rome. And it was actually quite common for um, female artists who were then known as sister painters to get these kind of portraits done of themselves. They would include it um, in their publicity circulations so that people... And I think this is quite heavily fashioned you know, as a stage image. She's looking off in the distance. Her nickname was Spirit. Often people wrote to her in letters and they called her John Gibson, um, a very famous Welsh sculptor, referred to her as spirit. And she was known to scry crystal balls for people like uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And you can see that she's kind of got this far off look in the distance. Um, again, this mystical personality. And here are some of the things that are part of that abundance of riches that are part of her archive, because her archive includes not only these letters, not only the art that eventually returned to um, Australia after her death, but also this thing, realia. So, or simply, let's put it in a more simple, straightforward way. Um, so we're going to go back to these and the story of hopefully where they came from, uh, that there are people in the room who know these objects very well because they came into their care. And those people also helped me um, triangulate these sources to tell this story. But the title for the book, which I kind of wrestled with in many ways, because it does sound, let's face it, it does sound a bit like a bodice ripper, right? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with yeah. that. So <laughs> Elizabeth Weiss and I, we wrestled for years about this. At one letter at a time, I got a letter from my parents saying, you can't call it that. No one's ever going to take you seriously. <laughs> Uh, I fought back and uh, in true Adelaide style. 
And here is a poem that she wrote in 1852. It's about, it's the only poem in her diary that she didn't publish in the colonial newspapers. And it really captures something about, I think, her romantic sensibilities. True is my wild love, true to thee, deep, deep as a fathomless sea. Tis the love of soul to soul allied, of the long and faithfully tried, that asks not to be loved. <laughs> uh, so who wrote a biography about Adelaide in the 80s and these kind of biographies kind of, kind of women's history projects in some ways. Um, she thinks that this point is Adelaide mourning Daniel Dennehy, the going off and eloping the woman in 1982 when she has been her. <laughs> so Daniel Dennehy was a very younger, richer whose name is also Adelaide. But I think, for me, this poem brings us into this romantic fascination with wildness. And this poem has kind of covered, accompanied me um, as I've been writing the book. Although it comes from a much later period, it's um, from the Irish writer. What I love about this poem is that Gerald Manley Hopkins used what is known as a sprung rhythm to write his poems. And I think Adelaide has a very similar rhythm in her poetry. It's not easy poetry to understand, but when you grasp that sprung rhythm, it starts to open up. And so I wanted to put this poem into our midst today as well. What would the world be once bereft of wet and of wildness? Let them be left. Oh, let them be left. Wilderness and wet. Long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. Now I think what one of the things about Adelaide is her passion for the landscape, for the environment, for the Australian wildflowers is, is caught up in this romantic period where wildness expressed freedom and a way of connecting with country. So I found these sort of things interest, really interesting. Yeah. Because she wasn't always known as Adelaide, was she? No. She had another name too. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So, in fact, in most of her letters and even some of her artwork, she signed herself Adelaide, she took the initials of each of her names and she called herself Izzy. So you can see just down here she mm. signed her name Izzy and in here she signed her name Izzy. And in many letters people refer to her as Miss I, Izzy um, or Elizabeth Barrett Browning refers to her as Izzy, which is quite exotic, I think. So I think that's how she preferred to refer to herself and be remembered. So in the book... I pick up that mantle. But why did she do that? What's wrong with Adelaide? <laughs> well, I live there. I think it's bloody marvellous. <laughs> oh, the name. Well, I think that's a really interesting question. Mm. It was a pretty popular name at the time. I oh, don't think that... She distinguished herself from others. Mm, from the other Adelaides. Mm. And also she, what she did was she inserted the name Scott into her middle name at the age of 14. And I think that might have been a reference to the Scottish heritage, which was part of her family. Um most likely, or Walter Scott, the great romantic, one way or another, it gave her a new name. And that name, interestingly enough, sounds a lot like the IC, which are, you know, the fae spirits that live on the threshold of the, of the dawn um, and are quite mischievous and difficult. Now, that interest in spiritualism in the Fae was very much a part of her interests. We see it all through her archive, whether it's these scribble scrabbles of mystical paintings that she's done, whether it's Elizabeth Barrett Browning talking about Izzy communing with the celestial spheres. So I think she was kind of, she may even have been trying to evoke some connection with the IC herself. Yeah, and it's really interesting with biography because I think when when you're writing biography, you get to feel you really know the person, even though of course you could never know them. But the hardest thing is writing in the first person as well, and you've chosen to write the book in the first person. Why did you do that? And was that really challenging? Yeah, <laughs> it really was. Um, so, you know, historians are kind of taught to keep a distance, mm. and so are biographers. And uh, I had actually produced a. Uh, a manuscript for the first two um, two thirds of the book, and I sent it to Elizabeth um, in I think March 2020, 
And she sent it back a couple of months later saying, it's just no good, it's not working. So well, that first manuscript was me, I think, trying to behave like a well-behaved historian, trying to show my research, being exhaustive in my research, um, but also kind of exhausting in the narrative because I was trying to show so much of the research. And so I sort of dwelt with that failure. <laughs> it was a bit of a sting, but that was... Did she say... There's this book called Elizabeth and Elizabeth. Have a look at it and do that. <laughs> of course she did. And I hope that you're so lucky that you're... <laughs> uh, yeah, but you know, I kind of spent a time looking my rose and in the Hall of Mirrors. And then I thought, you know what? I've been trying to be someone that I'm not. I think what I am is I use my historical research skills. I do the scholarly work from time to time. And I have huge admiration respect for people that do that exclusively. But for me, history is a way, you know, it, you can move through and to do other things with it. So um, for me, history is about meeting us in our moment. You know, it's always a conversation between the past and the present. And when I sat down to write, you know, I have to admit, I kind of felt like I was channeling her, mm, that sure. there was just this moment where having spent so much time with her archives, doing all the contextual research. I'd actually gone to 50 archival holdings across the world. So I'd been to Wales, a lot of time in, throughout England, looking at Ruskin's files, records all over the North. Um, you know, in a lot of time in Italy, retracing her footsteps. I spent about three months, it was terrible. And, uh, and even got into the secret Vatican um, archives in, in Rome, which was pretty exciting. And this was over a long period. Yeah, it? that's right, over a couple of years of research. And so when finally I sat down to start again, she just took over, I think, and wanted to be told in that particular way. So uh, I was terrified. And I still am. <laughs> I think I'm going to get pulled over the coals by people that think I have no right to do that. But honestly, I, I think that sometimes in historical conversations, we try to um, assert the idea that, that historians work with really firm facts and that history is the ultimate representation of truth. And I don't think it is. I think history is one way that we can access the truths of the past. But when it comes to how do we represent people who are underrepresented in the archives, mm -hmm. I think sometimes we need to come up with different types of techniques to do that. We need to, in a sense, break some of the rules in order to achieve the objective of creating a richer, more dimensioned past that is not just peopled with the the fellas in white in top hats who had the economics and the education and the influence to leave sources behind. If we stick only to the sources, Sue, mm. we're stuffed. It's always going to be the same distorted past. So if you have to crack a few eggs to make sure. a new omelette, then, um, you know, and why can't imagination be part of the historical process? I think for most of us, when we engage with our own family history or something, our imaginations are triggered and imagination is a radical, important element of the human experience. I'm a fan of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is what you call speculative biography, isn't yeah. it, very much? You've kind of got the, the basis, you've got the foundations and the groundwork, mm. and then you start building from there. Mm. But it's always very well informed mm. because you know your period, but you don't have to show it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly right. So, um, the idea, I think, is that you take E.P. Thompson's idea of the discipline of context and you go and do oodles and oodles of exhaustive research so that you can get that context. And then that, triangulated with the primary sources, which you've put in that context as well, starts to inform your imagination in a truly informed way. And so we're not stuck with the problem of presentism where, um, you know, we assume that people think like us or as Greg Denning once famously said, the people are just us in the past walking around in funny clothes. No, they're not. They think very, very differently. And Adelaide and Martha, um, her mother, certainly certainly did that. So, you know, um, John Docker and Anne Curtois are in the room and I've been really influenced by their wonderful book, uh, What is History?, where they talk about history's doubleness and they say, I'm just going to quote you guys, paraphrase you, you can correct me afterwards, but they basically say the generative power of history comes from its doubleness, the fact that it is both art 
and science. And so for me, the science is speculation. Scientists speculate. That is at the heart of their discipline. And yet we as historians, I think, are a little bit more covert, nervous about speculating. Well, I say let's get really honest about how generative speculation is for us and for readers. And then, you know, the creativity, the art side of that story is history is often told in narrative and narrative can be a very powerful laboratory in which you test your storytelling. You know, very often for me, I'd travel along a narrative based on my information and then suddenly it would just come to an end because I couldn't, it wasn't working. So, you know, I think narrative in itself can be a very potent laboratory to test your plausibility. Sure. Now, I think, ah, uh, yes, I had just, all right, I just wanted to throw a few quotes out here about Adelaide, which also inspired me to take risks. So these are some, some of the things that people said about her, um, that she was memorable for her enthusiasm and wild ways. And this is Robert Browning's first encounter with her. Harriet Hosmer, the famous American sculptor, said she was a queer body. Charles Nickerson the man who looms in this room today, I'm a bit nervous he's going to come and get me, <laughs> talked about her as being wild, impulsive and often irrational. And then John Ruskin, the most famous social reformer and art critic of the era, noble and fireworky. And then finally that ob obituary that appeared in the, in the most famous literary and art journal of the era, the Athenaeum, talked about her as no brighter star and in the very impersonation of genius. So when we get that, we get a lot of data sets on the type of person that she was. And she was a, she was a bit experimental and she was a bit outrageous and she pushed people's buttons. And that seemed to me important to kind of write a book that was in that spirit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also when you're writing books about historical women, it's really difficult because historical men, there's oft, often lots and lots of facts about them because they... They had those positions of power, so they were, everything they said was noted. Whereas for women, there just wasn't very much. So you kind of have to use a bit of speculation as well, don't you? Because why was the the story of women so important to you? Because I'm one, <laughs> sure, <laughs> and because I think that um, look, the colonial era um, got me from my honours year um, at Melbourne University when I was learning with Chris Wallace Crabbe, the poet and writer, and he kind of introduced me to the language and the poets of the early of early convict Sydney. And, uh, and I just loved them so much, but there were just no, you know, I felt like I was entering this kind of Regency Dickensian world um, that I just didn't know existed, was part of our literary culture. But there were no female voices and I just find that very hard to believe. And Adelaide is just such living proof that not only were there female voices uh, and that these women were often highly educated. I mean, she was reading Goethe in German. <laughs> She's, she could speak French and Italian. So could her mother, who was born in 1814. These people defy our stereotypes and assumptions. But also the men around her, People like um, Colonel Barney, a whole lot of kind of educated men, they supported her. They encouraged her to go to Europe. So contrary to the idea that, yes, it's true that colonial women were, typically, especially currency lasses, were expected to marry at 16, there were also these people that thought, you go, girl, <laughs> and, and wanted to help her make her path forward. So she must have had something as a personality. Absolutely. Yeah. She was born in 1831. So what would normally be li life be like for a woman then? Presumably it would be quite restrained and constrained by, by expectations. Well, I mean, I think that's a very interesting moment. There's a lot of extremely good historians in the room, so I'm feeling quite nervous now. <laughs> but um, I think we have to, you know, you, you, we often take the stereotypes that we get from the British world and then we have to bring them into the Australian context and and shift the lens quite a lot and nuance it based on the fact that it's a it's a penal society um, and the Georgian era has a lot of liberties and latitudes that we don't see um, in other parts of the world or were, that were particular to the Regency era and then you add that with the convict culture, it's got different freedoms. But, you know, it's, it's fair to say that most currency la la lasses like Martha were taken off the marriage market 
around their 16th birthday. But I think that that is why Martha moved Adelaide from living in Sydney at her 16th birthday and they went to live on the North Shore. You know, the harbour actually served as a bit of a natural moat, right, because suddenly young or elderly men couldn't come courting because, you know, people often ended up married to old lags, to people that were going to take them off into the bush or they were forced to live the life of governesses. You know, we've got in this book the spirit of Jane Eyre um, because there are many similarities. You know, remember that famous moment where Jane Eyre says to Mr Rochester, I'm a poor, plain, small, ordinary woman. Why would you be interested in me? Well, in fact... That's really how people saw Adelaide in many ways. Um, but, and Adelaide was also threatened with governessing, it seems. And uh, Jane Eyre just was described as fae. Mr. Rochester's always talking about her being married to the green people. And I mean, sorry, in, fa in the family with the, with the green people and, and very fae. And then Jane Eyre is also described as painting ideal works, which is exactly what Adelaide did. So I've sort of tried to bring Jane Eyre in to create a sense of the kinds of lives that young women had. I think that they had pretty good education. So this idea of them all kind of, you know, being rough and tumble and ready just isn't quite the story. These were a family um, the Redmond family that she came from were a very interesting family. There's some contention about who Adelaide's grandfather was. Some people say he was a, um, a convict from the second um, fleet. I believe from all the triangulation of research that I've done, despite um, some anomalies, that he was a first fleet Marine and he married a convict forger named Mary George, who was almost 30 years younger than him. But that family that they built down the bottom of Lower George Street, opposite the jail where he worked, was a family where they had a love of literature and poetry and song, and they loved their country as well. So what, what do we make of this? These are people living their lives. <laughs> and I guess if you've got a mother who's a forger, a grandmother who's a forger, yeah. that's kind of a good background for artistry, isn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, it was one of my first kind of my first things was to think of the hand of the forger as being how Adelaide first le learnt to draw. And, you know, it's interesting to note that in many ways, forgery was quite a middle-class crime. You had to be able to draw, obviously. You had to be able to plan your crime. But you also had to have enough performative spirit to be able to go and pass your note without anybody thinking that you were a forger. And Adelaide certainly had performative zeal, right? You know, there's this fabulous moment just before she leaves Sydney in 1855 in the winter of 1855 and uh and she it's the Crimean war is going on and Sydney siders are obsessed with the fact that the Ruskies are going to invade at any moment they're building tunnels under the, you know the North Shore they're building towers to make sure that they can see the first Rusky coming on the horizon through the heads and uh and so they've developed this voluntary corps, uh, a, a voluntary corps known as voluntary troops. And she designs a flag for them, a beautiful hand stitched silk banner. And it's got four flowers in the middle. We know this because it's all described in the newspaper, as is the moment, the wet and blustery day, where she stands on the hill of the outer domain and she presents the 500 troops or so with her banner. Now, at that moment, she gets up and she says, I declare myself to be a dutiful daughter of my country going to study in the old world so I can bring my fruits back to all of you when I return. But in her diary, we find this poem called The Sons of Fire. And this Sons of Fire poem has Izzy telling the troops that they must buckle on the girdle and fight for their country. They are the Sons of Fire and she is Izzy giving it to them. Now, she didn't present that poem according to the newspaper, but what a woman for having thought that she might. Because <laughs> she was very political, wasn't she, as yeah. well, in, yeah. in lots and lots of ways. Yeah. yeah, she was. She was an out-and-out -out Republican. Mm. So, you know, that's what the poetry tells us. That's what her letters to Dr. Lang, her friendship with Daniel Dennehy. Um, but it was a different type of Republicanism than the mm. one that we would imagine today. But when she got to Italy, you know, that was her dream to come to Italy and um, to become a soul sister with a public voice to... to 
live a life of aspiration on her own terms. Um, when she got there, she found that being a Republican was not a good idea. The Pope didn't like it. And most of the artists who were living in Rome kept their politics very quiet because you never knew when the Pope would throw you in jail. So here's Adelaide, wild and enthusiastic ways, suddenly being told by everyone, shut up. <laughs> if you want to be part of our society, zip it, girlfriend. Mm. She didn't really zip it, right, because we know in her one of her most famous paintings, The Marriage of Cana, that she depicts Garraboldi's face on the face of the bridegroom and of um, the figure of Christ as he's performing his miracle. And she did that quite deliberately to, you know, given up yours to the Roman community and to say, I believe in Garibaldi. I believe Garibaldi can bring fresh wine, fresh miracles to the people of Italy. I feel you're really channeling Adelaide beside me. I feel like I'm interviewing Adelaide. Sun's of fire! <laughs> The dress, I'm sure, as well, really. Yeah. But I guess the other side of Adelaide was she always loved painting wildflowers. Mm. She was much more kind of gentle outlook, mm. really. Um, can we hear a little bit from your book about that? Maybe? Yeah, I'd love to. Because that I'm, was great. I'm just going to move through these. Yes. So um, just before I do, I'll just quickly say that I've, I've thought of the book as a representing rather than a recovery of um, her life. And this painting here is one of her most famous paintings. It's called The Pilgrim of Art. And it depicts Adelaide and Martha on their pilgrim of art. Adelaide is seated, as, um, is seated there and she is depicted as the genius of art. And Adelaide is kneeled as the humble pilgrim who is accepting the, um, the laurel of genius. Now, this painting was valued at 1,500 pounds and celebrated by art critics at the time. But when it returned to Sydney, it was left in a three-sided shed associated with the Art Gallery of New South Wales, where it deteriorated beyond repair. So we don't have this painting anymore. So I wanted to represent. So the way I've written the book is to tell it through um, Isie's voice, but Martha also comes through. So it's a representing of that. And the other thing that we did was we lost the 40 plus Australian wildflowers that she painted. These were the wildflowers that won a prize for her, a silver medal. She was the only female artist to win a silver medal at the Australian Museum exhibition before she went, they were chosen to go on to the Paris International Exhibition. Um, and they were really celebrated, but there's a story to come around this. But for now, I'll just say that these flowers don't exists anymore, these watercolour flowers. And so I wanted to also represent those in the book by recovering moments when she's she's um she's out there so looking the and painting. Flowers don't exist anymore the, as well as the painting. The water flowers of the of the flowers. The watercolours of the flowers don't exist anymore. The flowers are there and uh, I'm very lucky to have Mark Schuster here uh, from uh, North Shore Council who took me on some wonderful journeys around the North Shore hunting out those flowers so that I could follow in Adelaide's footsteps and I also spent time on country with Auntie Fran um, Bodkin so that I could learn about the flowers from a First Nations perspective. So um I'll just quickly go through. Is it all right if I go through these slides and then I'll do the reading? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is uh, a picture, we believe, of Adelaide's grandmother, the convict forger. <laughs> and these are some silver spoons that uh, still belong in the family. And you can see that they've got an initial at the top, JMR. And they, they date back to the 1740s at a time when Edinburgh grooms or people growing up in the Edinburgh area would buy some silver spoons before they got married. And then while they were in town getting them engraved, they would have a bit of a bucks party and, uh, and would go on for quite a while. So these spoons, in all likelihood, belong to John Redmond, Adelaide's grandfather, to his grandfather. Silver spoons from Edinburgh? just doesn't sound like something that would belong to an Irish convict, which is what many people think he is. So there he was uh, down really quite close to Circular Quay and opposite the jail where they grew up. And in fact, we know where they grew up. We can kind of see it. So in this famous picture by Augustus Earl, many of you will know this picture already, but you've probably looked at it for different reasons. If you look at it, through the eyes of trying to find the Ironside Adelaide story, you can see George Street there. 
So we know where it is. And we know it's Lower George Street because we can see the masts in the background. And lo and behold, there are two Norfolk pine trees. Now, those Norfolk pine trees still belong in the oral history of the family. The family can tell stories about how their grandmother, how their mother um, was taken down to walk around Circular Quay and um, down the lower, lower end of George Street and was told stories about John Redman, the jailer, their ancestor, and the Norfolk pines that he had planted when he came back from from Norfolk Island. So fascinating, another piece there. And here is um, Adelaide's mother, a portrait done by Adelaide, and a man who we, I'm pretty sure that this is James Ironside, Adelaide's father. And the couple separated shortly after Adelaide's um, brother was born and died in 1834. And they went on to have <clears throat> distinct but overlapping lives. But it's just wonderful, you know, with this book, we can see several generations of colonial women. <clears throat> and these little excerpts also take us into Redmond's um, court where Adelaide grew up and the lives of her uncles. So in this excerpt here, they talk again about John Redmond, the jailer, being a First Fleet Marine. This is the school that Adelaide grew up with. These are the kind of art materials that she would have taken with her when she was doing her work. So... We might come back to a little piece about Martha if we get there. Um, and this is the a, a scene, the kind of scene that would have taken place of the banner presentation, one of her poems full of feisty wildness. And here we are in Crow's Nest Cottage where uh, she lived shortly before she left Sydney in 1854, 1855. This picture here um, still belongs in the family and looks kind of familiar, right? Anyone recognise or think it looks very much like a Conrad Martins? Maybe it is. Maybe Adelaide, who had had some training with him, had actually produced it in the likeness. She was a very good copyist. Who knows? But it takes us to the moment that I wanted to read from, if you'll allow me. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, uh, I thought you'd never get there. <laughs> okay, I will shut up soon. No, no, in more minutes. You've got plenty of time. So this is a moment towards the end of her time in Australia and she is collecting her wildflowers paintings at the moment. She's, on a, she's now on a mission. She needs to paint something like 30 Australian wildflowers in the next couple of months before she heads um, so that she's got her folio. She thinks she's going to do a folio of 50 wildflowers and show them and, uh, and then she'll go off to Paris with them. But she's having problems getting her 50 flowers because not all the flowers that she wants are in bloom. And the most important flower that she wants, the flower that is going to consolidate her reputation is of course the mighty Waratah. At this time Australia was actually known abroad as the land of the mighty Waratah and so having a Waratah is really important and so this is a little moment towards the end of the book where she goes out looking for her Waratah um, <clears throat> and there's a reference to one of her poems in here about the desert of At Atacama. It's a very strange poem but I've tried to bring her poetry in. All right, it's, it's a quick reading, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. So thank you. Say nothing to Mama, I ordered Hannah, who had surprised me in the kitchen as I was collecting my secateurs and basket in the dark. I want to surprise her when I return. Before she could reply, I was out the door and on my way to find my prize. It was a fine spring morning full of crisp, fresh breeze and magpie warble. And I made such good pro progress that within the hour, I was waving to Mrs. Jenkins' servant who was making the breakfast bread in the outside kitchen before passing the gate and going down through their orchard. I hurried down the old track until I got to the river road or rather what was left of it. For the winter had been so wet that much of the path was obscured by undergrowth and I had to push through the bracken and climb over the several fallen logs. Sometime during the next hour, I lost my footing and slipped down the bank. I scratched my face on something sharp along the way, and by the time I clambered back up the bank, my cheek was bleeding. That got me thinking about the large group of blacks who George said often made their camp a mile or so in the same direction. I had no idea what I would do if I crossed paths with one such person, let alone a whole party. So I took to singing loudly to announce myself in, in advance. When I got to the rise about an hour later, my nerves were on such edge, I had to catch my breath. To my delight, 
a vast plain stretched out below me, punctuated with a hundred or so great tr grass trees, their spear-like protrusions growing from grassy skirts in such a way that immediately made me think of Roman warriors. For a moment, I imagined myself the commander of this mighty force and was considering making a stirring speech to lead them into battle when I remembered my urgent purpose. <laughs> Pushing off along the ridgeline, I began scouring the countryside on either side, but when I found nothing, decided to trek off in the opposite direction. Some time after, a light drizzle began to fall, fill the valley with mist, but as the sun was moving in and out of the clouds, I figured it would soon clear and decided to scan the bushland over to the west. Halfway there, I spotted a splash of red in the, in the scrub and hurried down the slope before realising it was only bottle brush. How quiet and lonely it is, I thought, as I made my way back up the hill once more. I recalled the explorer who stumbled across the mummified humans in the desert of Atacama. That sent a chill through me as I trampled down into another galley, gully. By the time I got to the bottom, the rain was getting heavier and the lip of my bonnet began beginning to drip. Looking up to wipe the wet from my face, I noticed that heavy storm clouds had gathered over the rise. I decided to try one final route just one final route, but just as I was heading off in that direction, a fierce screech rang out across the valley and stopped me in my tracks. Seconds later, a flock of black cockatoos swept across the gloomy sky, filling the valley with their wild calls before disappearing into the darkening clouds. I was about to commence scouring again when I spied a single crimson feather spiralling and eddying in the air, and then... At long last, I saw it. Thanks to the many botanical sketches I had studied, I immediately recognised the tall, thin scrub with the grey-green stiffness of the leaves. Scrambling down the gully, heart pulsing like a hunter on its prey, I now hastened, sure that triumph was at hand. Within a few steps, however, I could see the first layer of the petals had only just opened and the waratora itself was yet to form its splendid lotus shape. In fact, there were only 30 or so formed bracts and each was still a dusky pink colour. I had come too early, I realised in horror, as I stood before the shrub in my wet skirts, fingering my secretaire. Cutting it now, before its time, was a dreadful thing, I knew, but so was the prospect of never finding another specimen. Even if I did bring it home, I cautioned myself, I could not be sure that it would ever blossom. Still, the idea of disappointing the colony and never getting to Paris was dreadful. <laughs> well, thank you. And it's wonderful just after that, she became the first Australian born artist to go and study overseas. It's yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. So she must have been so feisty to be able to do something like that and also so talented because when she went over there, she was really quite embraced, wasn't she? She was. She also had um, a mother who was very mm. committed. In fact, uh, uh, an Ironside descendant who's here today describes her as a bit of a tiger mum, and I think that's probably right. I think she was um, poor Martha Redmond, who we've seen, was... Um, made to get married at 16 and the marriage didn't last. And so she was pretty determined to encourage her daughter to have a different sort of journey. Um, and so they came with letters of introduction from Dr. John Moore Lang, who was then really, truly one of the most famous people in the 19th century. And he gave her letters to Queen Victoria's physician who became her physician to, and through that she got entree into the eminent Victorians of that era. And she kind of met everyone, including the Brownings, including John Ruskin. Like, you know, she made herself know. And everywhere she went, she would describe herself as the flower of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so she kind of knew how to use, you know, Australian wildlife mm. to further her own path forward Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Mm. And I'd just like to open it up. I wondered if anybody else has got any questions as well, really. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
secret diary, speaking to all those um, soldiers, encouraging to go and fight. And then how when she was looking at the trees and she would think of being a general, part of me wondered, did she sort of secretly yearn to be like a general, like if there was equal, you know, uh, rights for women as well? Mm -hmm. And all she could do was sort of paint flowers instead? Was that a theme or is that, was that something? Yeah, I really like where you're going with that. I mean, <laughs> what I'm trying to do with my work is be suggestive, you know, pick up the archives, use, you know, I've used, draw a lot of quotes directly from her. So in the book I describe that where I'm quoting verbatim, you know, and where I'm drawing on the on the spirit or changing the language to be more conversational. But really what does come through with that really rich question is a couple of things. And she certainly had a military taste, as many people did at that time. She kind of saw herself, you know, when we look at a lot of her pictures, there's women with swords, which makes me think that she was probably inspired like many of her era by Joan of Arc. She draws um, a lot of pictures of women. So I think so. When it comes to that other question that's embedded in your question, which I really like, which is what were her politics around women? You know, that was a question that I had to look, I looked in for a long, long time because the sister painters that went to Italy, many of them were overtly political about women's life. There were a group that she um, came to know, known as the Ladies of Langham Place, who were involved in women's petitions and married women's um, and property acts, et cetera, et cetera. And they were overtly political. We don't see that so much in Adelaide. What I do have is her signature on a petition and that was signed in Sydney in 1850 by over 9,000 women. It's a women's only petition. It's probably the first document of collective women's um, activism in Australia, but it was about the resumption of transportation. It was rejecting that. So there's political activism there, but not in the way that we might like her to be. She's not conven conveniently um, conforming to things, but she, there's little traces, you know, this phrase, elevate my sex. I think it's clearly something about that. But you had to tread a pretty careful path, you know. So John Ruskin, for example, who she came to know and be mentored by later, he said in the 1840s, women can't paint. They can't be original. And he said to someone that she probably met um, when he, this woman had done this amazing painting of um, Boadicea, brooding over her wrongs, which was clearly a political thing, right, a political painting. And she said, what do you, Ruskin said, what do you know about Boadicea? Go and paint me a pheasant wing. And the woman destroyed that painting and never painted again oh because God. of that. So to have the temerity, you also had to have clever social mobility skills. You needed to know when and how to say what you were going to say. So I think she was careful with that. But to be part of a group of women in Rome in particular, who called themselves the Jolly Female Bachelors. Many of them were lesbians. They were living proudly professional um, and, and, and personal freedoms. I think that it was part of her life, but not perhaps in the way that would be, we would like. <laughs> yeah. Thank any, you. any other questions? I'd also, also like to ask, I mean, she was a bit of a mystic as well and a medium mm. as, as mm. well, really, wasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, no, she absolutely was. Her poetry is inflected with phrases like up heaven fire, <laughs> the electric fires that are, growing, are, are blooming within me, the wild words that must gush forth from my soul. So she is really proudly part of a kind of romantic tradition, which I think, you know, so many 19, people who have worked in the 19th century, they tend to eschew or ignore spiritualism. But more recent scholars have said, if you want to understand the 19th century, you need to take abolition seriously, industrialism, uh, the women's movement. You also need to take spiritualism seriously. It was one of the most influential elements of 19th century society. And it was a big part of her life. And so I think this dismissing of all spiritualists as table turners and rappers and frauds is simply wrong. And what I see in her is She's influenced by German and Scottish transcendentalism, and she's having a seriously mystical encounter with the Australian landscape, with these flowers, and, and through art. And let's face it, how many artists don't? You know, so many artists do kind of live in those. Mm. They live in many dimensions at the same time. Absolutely. And like I mean, you and I, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yep.
did um, much writing of her survive about her interest in Garibaldi? I mean, obviously he was, you know, a celeb, you know, the um, very one of the most famous men of the period, and you know, she's going to the heart of it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Or... So, really, the only piece of evidence that we have, or a couple of pieces, uh, are her letters to Dr. John Mul Dunmore Lang, and in those she. She talks in one letter, she says, my heart will go on um, crying viva Garibaldi. You know, the cannons might be flying, the popes cut the telegraph, so we don't know what's going on, but my heart will go on doing this. So, you know, there she is, and she's saying that in the 18. 60s, 18, late 1850s, 60s, and that tells us that she's defying what the rest of the expatriate art, art community are doing. And then the other thing is this painting, The Marriage of Cana, right, which is in the Art Gallery of, of New South Wales on a permanent display. And she has painted not only the bridegroom, but the figure of Christ with Garibaldi's portrait. And she says that in a letter to Lang too. I've done this. It's going to shock them all, you know, but this is what I've done. And she did get some pushback for that. So she eventually was um, given a membership into a very elite art community academy in Italy. Uh, and her works were celebrated. But at the occasion when she was given that um, membership into the academy there was a kind of an event and a poem was written for her called the pilgrim of art and in it they said now you watch out <laughs> because you know as well as your beauty and your fiery spirit your beauty of soul and fiery spirit there are dogs mongrel dogs down below who will want to get you for the personality that you have so um, there's really not much more to go on mm -hmm. you have to piece a lot of this together to try and get a, a sense of it I think there was one more. Yeah, yeah. I think there was one more question. The last question. No. Yep. Great. I was just going to ask about the passage that you read and how speculative it is, and what sort of sources you use. Was it partly based on your own experience of going to that site, or were there sources? Yeah. In Adelaide? Adelaide. Yeah, no, that's a good question. That one is pretty highly fictional. Uh, so I don't know. Okay, so one, I know that Waratah do grow <laughs> in the North Shore area, and I know when they grow. Um, I don't. I don't know how she went about you know, the time period over which she painted her wildflowers. I suspect she started in 1848 when they moved and that her flowers got better over time because we have a couple of pastel works of, of, of wildflowers. Um, or we'll just, we have one of, crystal, of Christmas bells and it's a pretty ordinary juvenile sketch, nothing like the wildflowers, which were so celebrated. So what I'm trying to do there, Cathy, is kind of be patching together possibilities but it is about going to the North Shore looking at those sort of things and also knowing that the Waratah was a really celebrated work that it would have been quite hard to find the Waratahs um, and then I've also got that poem of hers which I've sort of featured in there also I did a lot of work on the North Shore itself and they told stories about First Nations people still living or still being very much a present on the North Shore and the area that I was depicting was an area where um, First Nations people were known to be living at the time. So you know it kind of the way that I conceptualize the book from an archival point of view is to work as closely as I can with every source. So I'm hoping that people who know the sources, know the papers, know the objects, when they're reading the book will be like, oh, there it is. There's this one. There's this one. But there are episodes in there where that's not so much the case. And that's one of those. But it felt to me that it, it kind of, in fact, it was my husband, Bri, who encouraged me to kind of do this piece because I wanted to create a sense of momentum that journey leading up to the art exhibition. So what we do know is that she presented her folio at the Australian Museum to the exhibition that had been designed for all the colonial works to come together before they were sent off to Paris. And we know that she arrived, her work arrived two weeks late. <laughs> so part of me trying to get to that moment was to work out what it would have stopped her. And what happens is she picks up a crappy Waratah, it doesn't work, and she gives up. And then somehow a Waratah appears. So that's a little bit of one of those narrative moments, you know, you're mm. trying to create narrative suspense as yeah. well.
Well, that's fantastic because I feel that you've really brought her to life on stage. I mean, I, I really feel like I've got to know her a little bit, which is fantastic. And I really enjoyed the book. And oh, anybody you. who hasn't bought it should go and buy it. But, uh, <laughs> but thank, thank you. you so thank much you. for sharing her with us. That's great. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Kira. There's only one formal thing left to do this evening, which is, I, I guess, to crack a bottle of champagne over the bow of the ship, um, <laughs> the book. Um, um, it's been a great honour to uh, uh, be able to host your launch. Can I just thank uh, Rosie and Elizabeth from uh, Alan and Unwin, who have been um, great supports and um, helping us get tonight done. Thank you so much, Sue, for... Pleasure. The probing questions and Kira, thank you for a, a fascinating um, thank you. Um, presentation. Yeah, um, the book is extraordinary, Wild Love, and um, I very much look forward to reading it myself. Um, and thank you for the honour of being able to say that it is officially launched. Thank you. Congratulations on all your hard work, and thank you yeah. for bringing Adelaide Ironside into the twenty first century uh, to thank allow you. us readers to get to know her. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Congratulations. you. And. Can I just say a big thank you to you, Craig, to Sue, to my husband, to all my friends and um, colleagues that are here, and, and also to the team at Alan and Unwin, and particularly Elizabeth, who has been with me on this journey since we signed the contract on the 4th of October 2016. We have been through it together, and um, I just cannot thank you enough, Elizabeth, for your integrity and your commitment. Thank you. Copies are available from the museum shop. Uh, Kira will be doing book signings out in the foyer. Um, please stay and enjoy the museum. Um, I think our pop-up bar is still going, but also uh, Sounds Cafe down on level two, if you would like a drink and something to eat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kira. Thank you, Sue.